Pan-Africanism, the idea that peoples of African descent have common interests and should be unified. Historically, Pan-Africanism has often taken the shape of a political or cultural movement. There are many varieties of Pan-Africanism. In its narrowest political manifestation, Pan-Africanists envision a unified African nation where all people of the African diaspora can live. History of Pan-Africanist Intellectuals Pan-Africanist ideas first began to circulate in the mid-19th century in the United States, led by Africans from the Western Hemisphere. The most important early Pan-Africanists were Martin Delaney and Alexander Crummel, both African Americans, and Edward Blyden, a West Indian. Delaney, who believed that black people could not prosper alongside whites, advocated the idea that African Americans should separate from the United States and establish their own nation. Crummel and Blyden, both contemporaries of Delaney, thought that Africa was the best place for that new nation. Motivated by Christian missionary zeal, the two believed that Africans in the New World should return to their homelands and convert and civilize the inhabitants there. For Du Bois, the problem of the color line was not confined merely to the United States and its Negro problem. The Pan-African Congress movement during the 20th century, advocates of Pan-Africanism, made many efforts to institutionalize their ideas and to create formal organizations to complement the work of Pan-Africanist intellectuals. The first meeting designed to bring together peoples of African descent for the purpose of discussing Pan-Africanist ideas took place in London in 1900. The organizer was Henry Sylvester Williams, a native of Trinidad. The meeting was attended by several prominent blacks from Africa, Great Britain, the West Indies, and the United States. Du Bois was perhaps the most prominent member of U.S. delegation. The first formal Pan-African Congress, the first to bear that name, took place in 1919 in Paris and was called by Du Bois. That meeting was followed by a second Pan-African Congress two years later, which convened in three sessions in London, Brussels, and Paris. The most important result of the second Pan-African Congress was the issuance of a declaration that criticized European colonial domination in Africa and lamented the unequal state of relations between white and black races, calling for a fairer distribution of the world's resources. The declaration also challenged the rest of the world to either create conditions of equality in the places where people of African descent lived or recognize the rise of a great African state founded in peace and goodwill. After a third Pan-African Congress in 1923 and then a fourth in 1927, the movement faded from the world picture until 1945, when a fifth Pan-African Congress was held in Manchester, England. Pan-Africanist ideas first began to circulate in the mid-19th century in the United States, led by Africans from the Western Hemisphere. Among the more important Pan-Africanist thinkers of the first decades of the 20th century was Jamaican-born black nationalist Marcus Garvey. In the years after World War I, Garvey championed the cause of African independence, emphasizing the positive attributes of black people's collective past. His organization, the Universal Negro Improvement Association, UNIA, boasted millions of members, envisioning and then making plans for a return back to Africa. Garvey's Black Star Line, a shipping company established in part to transport blacks back to Africa as well as to facilitate global black commerce, was ultimately unsuccessful. Despite their origins outside the United States, such Pan-Africanist thinkers drew many of their ideas from African-American culture. Furthermore, James and Padmore resided in the United States for significant periods of time. An exchange of ideas about Africa and peoples of African descent took place between those intellectuals and African Americans, with African Americans taking the lead. It was, in many ways, a black Atlantic intellectual community. Senghor and Césaire, in particular, were greatly influenced by Du Bois and by several Harlem Renaissance writers, especially County Cullen, Langston Hughes, and Claude McKay. By the late 1940s, the African-American intellectual leadership of the movement had receded, with Africans now taking the lead. That was due in part to the leftist or communist sympathies of many Pan-Africanist advocates, as in the late 1940s and early 50s, the United States was in the midst of a Red Scare, 
when Americans with communist affiliations or sympathies were actively persecuted and prosecuted. The most important figure of this period was Kwame Nkrumah of Ghana, who believed that European colonial rule of Africa could be extinguished if Africans could unite politically and economically. Nkrumah went on to lead the movement for independence in Ghana, which came to fruition in 1957. Many African Americans cheered those developments in Africa. Pan-Africanist cultural thinking re-emerged with renewed force in the United States in the late 1960s and 70s as one of the manifestations of the Black Power movement. By the early 1970s, it had become relatively common for African Americans to investigate their African cultural roots and adopt African forms of cultural practice, especially African styles of dress.